Well, it's uh, Tuesday morning, and you're willing away at your inbox in your office, and a phone rings, and a woman from your congregation has called. She cries, she talks through the issues that she's struggling with in her marriage, and then 20 minutes later, you agree with her to meet with her the next day. Uh, As a pastor or pastor's wife, you've heard all kinds of problems occur within your setting and your congregation. You've heard the cries of help of sheep who are needing a shepherd. Christians struggling with difficulties of sin and suffering in this fallen world. Stubborn depression, heart-wrenching adultery, volcanic anger, chronic miscommunication, guilt-ridden pornography, color calorie-phobic eating disorders, recurrent cancer, hidden same-sex attraction, suicidal thinking, and that's just the short list. Life in a fallen world is full of misery. The work of caring for God's people is not easy. Pastors have often said to me, counseling is the hardest part of my job. And it's no surprise You think of your typical evangelical seminary with a 100-hour credit degree for an MDiv, usually they offer one counseling class. And so a pastor walks into a pastorate, and it's trial by fire. You're forced into the crucible of other people's problems with little or no training. And so under the heat and pressure of ministry, you just got to figure it out. Well, here's our goal for the next 45 minutes. I want to talk to you about shepherding. And what we want to do is think about what it means to be a pastor shepherd. This is a word to shepherds about shepherding. And that's what we want to think about together. Do you know how to tell who a shepherd is? He's dirty, he's smelly, he's sweaty, and he's bloodstained. Because he spent time with the sheep. Shepherding is hard work. It's not for the fearful. It's not for the faint-hearted. It's not for anyone who is not willing to take on the hard work that's called to any shepherd. So my prayer as we spend some time thinking about this is that you'd be encouraged in your faithfulness as shepherding as an under-shepherd of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. So seven things I want to say to you. And I've given you a handout to lay out the points and the main texts and points are, should be in there. So seven things I want to say about shepherding. Number one, consider the chief shepherd, Jesus. So two key words, condescension and sympathy. First, condescension. People riddle this word with negative connotations, but what an appropriate thing to say as a Christian. Jesus condescended to us. Philippians chapter 2, in humility, count others better than yourselves. That's verse 3. And then Christ humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. Verse 8. Our Lord existed on a plane above us in perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, with no sin and no suffering to plague him. And yet, and yet, he put interests of our, us ahead of himself by humbling himself, being able to face the greatest of all problems that is death itself for us. Jesus condescended to us. And then sympathy. Christ put himself in a position to sympathize with suffering people. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. Jesus faced a sin-plagued world, and unlike us who gave in to temptations, he faced the full force of those temptations. The sinless one never gives in. He understands the full force of temptation better than we because he did not give in. Leon Morse says this very well. He says, The sinless one knows the full force of temptation in a way that we who sin do not. We give in before the temptation has fully spent itself. Only he who does not yield knows its full force. 
So Jesus gets it much better than we do. He understands to a degree that's unconceivable to us. Now, I I hate double negatives. I I don't really know what the point is of two negatives in the same sentence. (laughs) But here we go. The, The text says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. So we flip it over positively. We do have a high priest who can sympathize. That's what he's telling us. Because Jesus understands the full force of the temptations, he can sympathize with what we're going through. Do you want to be like Jesus? Then sympathize with your people. Like Jesus, who's willing to condescend to us and face temptation like us, so also we should wade into the troubles of our people. Just like Jesus, who took initiative first, so also we initiate with our people. Just like Jesus, who humbled himself first, we also should humble ourselves before our people. Just like Jesus, who gave up his life for us, so also the shepherd gives up his life for the sheep. Number two, our responsibility to shepherd God's flock. You see there, 1 Peter 5 on your handout. The Apostle Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So Peter's writing to Christians who are enduring suffering and are fighting for faith. He's writing to encourage the believers to testify that this is the true grace of God. And so he says to them, chapter 5, verse 12, stand fast in it. And here in chapter 5, Peter's making an appeal to the elders in the churches of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And it's interesting that he doesn't roll out his credentials as an apostle first. Look at what he says there. He appeals to them as a fellow elder. He says, I'm an elder just like you. And this is how we as shepherds carry ourselves and care for others. Yet, he's not too far from reminding us that he also is impossible. You, apostle, you see there, he says, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He was there when Christ was crucified. So Peter says, the very one that we all are going to see one day, I have seen crucified. And he's also going to remind us that we'll share in the glory to be revealed. Suffering precedes glory. Suffering precedes glory. This is our hope that after suffering, glory does come. And Peter holds this out as a hope to the Christians who are suffering there. That their suffering would not end in futility. So it's on the basis of these three things that he makes his appeal. Appeal as a fellow elder, a personal witness of the sufferings of Christ, and one who will share in the glory to be revealed. He makes his main point there in verse 2. What does he say? He says, shepherd the flock of God. That's the main charge in this text. Shepherd the flock of God. His goal is to encourage you as shepherds. Now, don't think of those effeminate little statues of sheep that you see in stores or on cards. That is not at all what we're talking about. No, shepherding is dirty, manly work. It might require a shepherd actually to kill a bear or a lion in order to protect the sheep. And as an elder, you're called to shepherd God's flock. You're entrusted with God's own sheep. What a privilege. What a privilege. The the chief shepherd himself looks at you and says, Take care of my sheep. 
as an under-shepherd, you carry this weighty responsibility of caring for God's own. We work on behalf of God and care for what is God's. Now, do you see this as a burden or a privilege? You know, many of us have been in that position where you're working away and then whether it's an email that hits your inbox or it's a voicemail on your phone and you see who that is and you groan. You think, oh no, not again. It's been weeks or months, or in the case of some sheep, it's been years. Years that you've been laboring with them to care for them in their sin and their suffering. And you think, when, when will this end? <laughs> how, how often do I have to care for this person? How many hours do I give over to shepherd them through this life? Love turns into hard labor, patience turns into impatience, and frustrations mount. And, and the work of shepherding turns into a chore. Can you relate? Am I the only pastor who's ever been in that position? <laughs> this is when you remind yourself, this is God's sheep, not my own. This is God's flock, not my flock. This is God's children, not my children. What a privilege it is to care for God's own. What a weighty responsibility it is to care for the herding sheep. God says, I will love, I will tend to, I will rescue, I will comfort, I will feed, I will bind up, I will protect my sheep. And then he looks at you and says, so you do also. Because you are one of my shepherds. This is God's flock, not my own. And God himself, the great creator and redeemer of the universe, has asked you and me to care for them. Oh, brothers, oh, sister, care for lost souls on behalf of the one who loved them more than we could ever love. Now, verse 3, you see that participle, exercising oversight. And that qualifies that verb, shepherd. So you're charged to tend, protect, guide, feed, teach, call, exhort, comfort, bind up, and encourage the sheep. Those are all functional responsibilities of a pastor. Shepherding and oversight is the two basic functions of every pastor. And then in the section right before, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 19, Peter, Peter's making an appeal to the elders to consider the suffering of the believers that are among them. So your charge then is to care for the Christians who are suffering. That, that's the basic charge of this section. And he, he sets up in verses 2 and 3, three contrasts. You see the contrast there. On the one side is a ditch, and he warns you not to fall into it. And on the other side is an aspirational goal. Peter says three times, not this, but that. And let's consider what they are. He starts with, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. You should not shepherd out of a sense of obligation. I have to do this. I must do this. You should shepherd because you want to and God has asked you to do this. Do you shepherd out of obligation or joy? If it's obligation, that's a bad place to be. But do you freely and willingly give up your life to pastor God's flock? Because you know that's what God wants you to do. The second phrase there, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Peter's warning, be careful of your motivation of being a pastor. Never, never do we want dishonest gain or greed or self-interest to motivate what we're doing. Rather, Peter encourages us to shepherd with eagerness. It's not just that you're willing, but that you desire to do this. The NIV translators add to serve, to serve with eagerness. And what an appropriate thing to say. Oh, that God would root out any self-interest and any greed 
or any way that this ministry revolves around my selfish desires. But that I would do it eagerly, willingly, and serving Him. And that third phrase, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. Anyone who's entrusted with a position of authority is in a dangerous position of, at any point, being able to abuse that authority. Any pastor who domineers, who is harsh, who is excessively restrictive, who flaunts power, is abusive of their authority. Abusive authority is wrong fundamentally because, not because they're looking at you, but because it's a lie about God. Oh, that we would use our positions to teach people what it means to love and trust a a, a heavenly father. And you stand every week, almost every day, as as a living picture to them of what the God the Father is like. So never, never use your position in any kind of abusive way because it lies to them about God. Instead of domineering, Peter talks to church members to look at the life of an elder and follow his example. Throughout Scripture, the apostles often talk about imitating their way of life and their faith. So also, as a pastor, your life is actually one to be imitated. It's actually not optional for you as a pastor. You stand up every day and every week as an example to the flock. Now, this is a hard thing to do. I of all people know my sins the best because I deal with them every day. And I don't want to stand up as an example every day. Think, really, Lord, me? (laughs) You want other people to look at my life? I had a chance to teach a, a, a congregation out in California two years ago. And the pastor asked me, can you talk to us about parenting children? I thought, no, no, I don't want to. Do you know how much of a hard time we're having in our home? You know how many issues we have with our children? (laughs) Do you know how much I struggle as a parent? You know how dependent I am on God's grace for this? And so I told him, no, I'm not going to talk about parenting. I'll talk about anything else, but not that. And he came back to me, he begged, he said, please, we need help. And I said, all right. I'll do it, but only because you asked twice. <laughs> do you ever feel the pressure of constantly being an example in front of the flock? That's a hard thing to do as a pastor and a pastor's wife because you feel the pressure of other people looking in on your life and watching you and whatever you're doing. You feel the criticism of your life because other people are watching everything you're doing. And yet you remember, God calls you to be an example, to live a life of faith. And though we are dim reflections of a beautiful Savior, we are reflections nonetheless to help God's people. And then finally, Peter ends by pointing elders to the chief shepherd, Jesus. When when the chief shepherd appears, the elders will receive an unfading crown of glory. When Jesus returns, your heavenly reward comes. Now, sorry, here's a big word. Here we go. Here's your eschatological motivation. In the end, there is an unfading crown of glory. Do you actually look forward to that? I know in the day-to-day struggles and the troubles of God's people that I often can get so caught up with the troubles that are right in front of me that I forget to look at the end of the story. I lose sight of actually seeing that one day I will be with the chief shepherd and there will be an unfading crown of glory that awaits those who faithfully serve him. Number three, the goal of shepherding, maturity in Christ. Maturity in Christ is the goal. First Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. Him who we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil with all his energy that he, 
He powerfully works within me. And then Ephesians chapter 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So what a delight it is to grow up the people of God in Christ. It's not just helping the weak, but it's actually helping every member, every member to grow in maturity in Christ. Now, I I haven't been in the pastorate as long as many of the men in this room. But you think about some of those who came to you in those first few years and what the Lord did with them over the course of many years in growing them in greater maturity. And then same thing for, for different women in the congregation, their wives or other women who grew up in greater faith. What a delight it is to see God's people grow in faith over the course of years, to become mature. That is the goal. So a question for you. Do you agonize over the sanctification of your people? Number four, the opportunity to love on the front lines as God's people go through crisis and suffering. Now, you think about the way a relationship typically works. Um, A person A goes to person B. They start to get to know one another. They start spending time with each other. As they build the friendship, they start growing greater trust with one another. And as they become in greater trust with one another, they start opening up about things and sharing deep things and getting to know each other very personally. Now you think about how it works for a pastor. Somebody walks in my office. You know, I know them, but I might not know them all that well yet. And they begin to share their deepest and darkest struggles. That's not natural. (laughs) That's not the way relationships normally work. And yet here they are, they're opening up to you about the hardest things in their life. They're asking you to consider what are the deepest and darkest things they're struggling with, the sins and the difficulties. Forget all the normal pleasantries. They show up and they actually dump the trash of their life on your front yard. And they expect you to clean it up. Now, they're a foolish sheep. You've seen it, Christians who do dumb things, well, extraordinarily dumb things. And they're in your congregation. They make foolish decisions, extraordinarily foolish decisions. And they come to you and say, what do I do? As they're facing the consequences of their own decisions. If I had a penny for every time I prophetically warned a church member, don't do this, do that. I would be a rich man right now. (laughs) In those moments, you know, you pray for the heart of the father who took on the shame of the wayward son rather than the heart of the older brother who trumpeted the shame. It's no exaggeration to say to you, pastor, that you were a perverted fool once and God in his mercy saved you lifted you up out of the darkness and brought you into the kingdom of light. He showed mercy to you, giving you the righteous wisdom of his own son. So, you know, when foolishness walks in the door, the first thing I got to remember, God saved me by showing me mercy. And so I need to show mercy to all those who come across my path. You know, we have, um, we have a congregation average age of 30. So we have uh, a 1,000 people in one service on Sunday morning. So we have a lot of 20 and 30-year-olds. Now, as a 48-year-old man, I hear some of the 20-year-olds sharing things they did. And I think, really? Seriously? And then I walk home and I think, oh, I did that in my 20s. And I'm surprised how often I actually now can recall that. (laughs) And God showed mercy to me. So also I show mercy to others. 
I've been surprised how often someone comes in to get help. And at the end of the session, they'd say, I expected condemnation, not mercy. Then they're herding sheep, you know, weak and fragile, who need our tender care. In our church, a sexual offender broke in to the house of a newlywed wife, and he grotesquely raped her. Just imagine the husband when he got that phone call saying your wife was just raped. And imagine the wife. You know, just, just a few weeks into marriage, facing that. So here I am, it's over a decade ago, I'm pretty much a brand new pastor, and this occurs in our congregation, and I get the phone call. The, the, uh, the administrative pastor and his wife, who had taken them in immediately, after they'd been at the hospital and was caring for them, he said, as soon as she's ready, you need to be ready to come over, because I'm going to need your help starting to walk through this with them. So about a day later, he calls and said, she'd like to see you come over. So I did. I turned to my wife and I said, all right, you know, this is a category 10. I need to go right now. So I did. And I can remember still standing at the front door and just praying. And as a brand new pastor saying, Lord, I I don't really know what I'm going to say. I'm not really sure what I'm about to do here. So I really need help right now. And I walked in and sat down with her husband and her. The man had had so brutally beaten her that her face was completely swollen. She could barely see out of her eyes. And so we sat and we talked. And I listened and we talked and I read scripture and we talked and then we prayed And for the course of that next year, I met with them weekly to help them through their suffering. It was several years later where we were talking about things, sharing with one another, and she said to me, you know that first meeting? You know what was most helpful? And I said, no, actually, I don't know at all. She said, first, you you didn't just dwell on our sufferings. You took us to glory. You you, you took us to the end of the story. You took us to the place where there was no suffering anymore. You didn't make me just sit in the middle of my suffering. But the second thing was probably the most surprising. She said, you looked at me in the face. You just think about it. Her face was beaten in. It was swollen. She couldn't see. She said, every person those first few weeks couldn't maintain eye contact with me. They'd look at me in the face and look down. Do you know how that made me feel? I wasn't thinking about that. (laughs) I just looked her in the face because I was so broken about what she was experiencing. You know, you go through that list of, these are not the things they teach in seminary. (laughs) But it was something as simple as looking at her in the face and reading to her Revelation chapter 21. That's what she needed in the moment. Oh, what a privilege it is to help the herding sheep. To help those who are in hard, hard situations, who go through unbearable suffering. And we can go on about all the other kinds of sheep that you need to help. The confused sheep who need guidance. The wayward sheep who need a stern word. The angry sheep who need to learn how to get self-control. Every problem, every burden, every struggling sheep shows up. And you know what? That's an opportunity. It's so easy to actually see problems as simply problems, as burdens, as obstacles, as disappointments, as frustrations. And yet God says they're opportunities. Here's a chance to see God work. Here's a chance to to take things that are mired in the ashes and see redemption rise out of it. Here's a chance to see the gospel come to bear. Every difficulty is a life in which there's a chance to grow in greater maturity in Christ. Your people don't see that, and that's part of your responsibility. 
It's to help them see beyond the boundaries of their own problems, to look beyond them and to see the glories of heaven. They can't see that, but you can. And that's a part of your responsibility, to show them that grace is at work. What do you do as a pastor? You hold out hope to the hopeless. You know, what do you do as a pastor? You're charged with every difficulty to reconcile God's people to their God. Number five, our skills as a shepherd, listening and probing hearts. Listening is the most basic thing you can do for hurting people. Forget about that magical moment where the tweetable line spills out of your mouth and then all the troubles of that person just simply washes away because your amazing wisdom has poured out and made this situation all better. That happens in Disney movies or counseling books. It doesn't happen in real life. You know, listening is actually really hard work if you want to be good at it. Most of us don't have the patience to really listen to the person that's in front of us. The biblical picture of a bad listener is the proverbial fool. Listen to these verses. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. If one gives an answer before he hears, it's his folly and his shame. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. The biblical picture of a fool is one who doesn't listen and understand, but speaks too quickly. He's impulsive. He answers before he hears. He doesn't take the time to hear and then speak. In 18.2, the fool finds pleasure only in saying what he or she wants to say. And then 18.13, because of his impulsive speech, Lack, he lacks understanding, and he's deemed foolish and shameful, or as one commentator said, stupid and a disgrace. Contrast that with James. What did the apostle say? Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Chapter 1, verse 19. James' encouragement is the exact opposite of the proverbial fool. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. How good of a listener are you? Here's a little thing I want you to do. I want you to rate yourself. Here's the rating. Number one, you're the worst listener on the planet. And number ten, you're the best listener in the entire universe. Go ahead, take a moment now. I want you to get a number in your mind. All right, here's what you do with that. Because you you probably think more highly of yourself than you deserve. (laughs) So you're going to go to someone who knows you well. For many of you, that'll be a spouse. And you're going to say later today at lunch, Honey, what would you rate myself? (laughs) And, And you can only do that if you're humble enough to hear their answer. Because then you're going to say, Oh, honey. I rated myself as an eight. Why did you rate me as a three? (laughs) And when you have that conversation, you're actually going to learn from your spouse or your parent or your roommate or your best friend what it is you need to do to grow as a listener. And that's going to help you as you care for God's people. Now, in addition to listening... To get to know someone, you've got to ask questions. That's a basic skill of being a shepherd. You're shopping not just for circumstantial details. You're asking questions to collect information about a person's life. And, you know, asking common sense questions is actually easy. You can get through the details of a church member's life by asking lots of factual questions about a situation or about their life to get a sense of the larger context of their problems. Yet the danger is we're more prone to collect factual data about a person's life than ask questions that pursue depth. In my mind, depth questions are heart-oriented questions. You know, they're harder to ask because they're actually intrusive in a person's life. They expose 
the central part of who they are. They expose their heart. They expose who the person is. You know, pursuing a person's heart helps you to understand the thoughts and desires and motivations that are behind their life. It's not a casual conversation. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to not just ask the questions about circumstances, but probe and press into a person's life? It's not an easy conversation. It's an uncomfortable conversation. It's like excavation on an archaeological site. You're going underneath the circumstances and you're digging at the heart that lies behind that. And you want to pull that out and actually stare at it together. Now, if you're not sure how to do this or you think, I need to grow in that, well, this is something to pray about. This is something to ask older, wiser pastors for help. This is something to read more about. Here's my challenge to you. I want you to think about somebody in your life who we all have concentric circles. There's your inner circle and there's a range of friendships. There's a lot of people you know, but there are lots of people who live at the periphery. I want you to think about some of those casual relationships, especially those entrusted to your care, and the next time being able to ask a probing question. You know, it's, it's a conversation that you can even ask on Sundays, as, you, as many of you, as I am, standing at the door on Sunday as people are leaving. It's not just, how was your week? How's your heart today? What are you bearing up under this week? What are you worshiping this week more than God? You know, you ask a few questions like that, and some people are going to go, whoa, hold on. I was just here to say, have a good Sunday, (laughs) and head out to my pod roast. And now you want me to expose my heart here? (laughs) And yet, you know, there, there are so many lonely people who are living in terminally superficial relationships who are dying for someone to ask them a probing question. So my challenge, think about some of those people who live at the periphery and give them a chance by probing in a little bit more and seeing what the Lord would unearth and you leading the way in helping them. Number six, the bigger picture, a culture of discipling and care. Now, sheep, especially weak sheep, have an extraordinary ability to consume a pastor's time. My question for you, are you being proactive in raising up elders, raising up church members, raising up leaders who can actually come alongside of you and help you shepherd the flock rather than doing what many pastors do, sitting in a defensive posture and simply putting out the fires as they show up at your door? Be very wary of letting the burdens of hurting and angry and confused sheep fall exclusively on your shoulders. Just don't do that. It's a disservice to yourself, to your family, to the leadership, and to the congregation. And especially a disservice to the members because it denies them an opportunity to love on other church members. We know that God has designed the church as a key institution for advancing his kingdom And we're meant for community. We're meant for relationships in a church community. Individual Christianity is an anathema. Individuality in our society is suicidal. There just should be no such thing amongst Christians. We're meant to be in community. And our survival is dependent on us being with God's people. So I want to establish discipling and investment in other people's lives as a priority for any Christian who comes to our church. So as they become of our church, we encourage them not to isolate themselves, but build into the lives of others. So if if you were to come to our church, what you'd see is in the church membership class. We have a whole class on church covenants and the obligation of living the Christian life together as a community, of pouring into each other's lives. Or if you were to watch us in a membership interview, as I'm interviewing a prospective member as an elder and talking to them about being a part of this church, I'm going to at one point look at them and say, every Christian has a responsibility to disciple and be discipled, to be invested in the lives of other members. And I'm going to look them right in the eye and say, are you willing to do that? 
I want to personally ask them that question. And the introverts say, oh, that's asking a lot of me. And the extroverts say, yes. (laughs) And yet it doesn't matter where you are. It's a responsibility of every Christian to be invested in the lives of other Christians. It's a fundamental responsibility of being a, a, a church member. So here's the principle. I want to encourage them to build relationships when things are good before suffering enters in. I want them to build relationships within the church so that when the hard times come, that spiritual safety net of other people, godly people who know them, is already there to catch them. Unlike the weak sheep who often haven't poured into the church, stay on the fringe, and then when something goes bad, they call you. And you're bearing the weight of that. And you say, who else do you know? And say, really, I don't know anybody else. You think, oh, I'm going to have to carry most of this right now. No, encourage them to build in right away. Don't let them wait. Ask them to do that as soon as they show up. As soon as they commit to your church, say, start getting to know the other people. Start pouring into the lives of others. Now, you know, where do I get this? It's not some fancy program I came up with. I think it's pretty easy to show this from Scripture, and there's a number of ways you can do that, but the most straightforward way is simply the one another text. If you just think what that is, the one another text in Scripture are the responsibility of Christians towards one another. I put them there for you to to seize. Look Look at these texts. John chapter 13, a new command I give you. To love one another as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's John chapter 13. Romans chapter 12. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Then Romans chapter 13 again. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Then Romans chapter 15, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Then Romans chapter 15 again, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Then Ephesians chapter 4, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Then Ephesians chapter 4 again, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. These verses are speaking to Christians, and here's the general direction. To oblige Christians to love one another, be devoted to each other, to honor one another, to accept each other, to be patient with each other, to be kind with each other, to be compassionate, forgiving, and even to instruct one another. There is an obligation for Christians to be invested in each other's lives. And I think it's unavoidable if you're reading your Bible. I think it's plain and clear, according to the text, that Christians have a responsibility to care for each other. So as you can tell, this is a priority for the whole church. I I want a culture where the entire church gets the responsibility of caring for each other. I want an entire church where discipling and care of each other matters to the congregation. You know, and when I'm saying culture, I'm not referring to a program. I want this to be written into the DNA of the church. This is the way Christians understand how they should live. Your members don't have to sign up somewhere or join a program in order to love one another and do each other spiritual good. So, pastor, you are the primary culture shaper in your own congregation. Have you made this a a, a primary value within your church? Have you taught this to your members, the importance of investing in one another and caring for each other? Because as you, you teach it, and then as you teach it, and as you teach it, and then as you teach it again, you start to get it into the bloodstream of your church. And then as you do that, then you pray for it, and you pray for it, and you pray for it again. So that they understand that this is a part of what it means to be a Christian. 
You know, just imagine this. It's not just you bearing the burden anymore. But actually, it's the whole congregation that knows how to help one another. It was, it was many years ago when I actually got a phone call related to a young lady in our church who had attempted suicide. She had had a dreadful year. She had made multiple attempts on her life in that year. And so I got the phone call, as I typically do, and I rushed to the hospital to be by her bedside. You know, it was my delight as a pastor to see two single women had beaded me there. They, they were standing by her on her bedside, and not only had they opened up the word to her and prayed over her, but they had encouraged her. And by the time I arrived, they were playing card games in order to lighten her spirit. You know what a delight that is to me as a pastor? To see the members, when they hear the word suicide, not back away. Or, you know, as many members do, that instinctual gut reaction, oh, I need to call the pastor because he's the professional counselor. He's the one we paid. He's the one who should take care of this. No, they hear the word suicide and they say, I'm going to go. I'm going to rush to their side. I'm going to care for them. I'm going to love on them. I'm going to be the one who's first there. You know what a delight that is for me as a pastor? It's no longer just me. It's the whole church that's bearing the weight and responsibility for each other. I think that's how God meant for it to be. That we do it together as a church. Number seven, our perseverance, making it to the end. So, you know, wh why do we come to conferences like this? Why do we take a break from the normal routines of a pastor and the normal burdens? Because some of you are weary. Some of you are tired. Some of you are struggling. Some of you are discouraged. Some of you are drained. You know, a few of you might be even hanging on to a thread. You've weathered storms. You've faced difficult situations. You've had hard years. You've been through things that you thought you'd never be through. And yet, here it is, you're here. Christ knows your burdens. Christ knows what you've been through. I'm so encouraged to hear in, in Daniel chapter 10, as the Lord speaks to Daniel, these words, and so also I say to you, O man, greatly loved, fear not, be strong and good courage. Your Savior is great. Your circumstances may be hard, but God is great and not small. Jesus is strong and not weak. God is mighty and holy and glorious. And you, you are one of his sheep. We should never forget that. The shepherd himself is a sheep. So every morning as I wake up to, to read God's word, you know, I shift into pastor mode. Oh, how do I teach this to God's people? You know, what's the sermon outline? Okay, well, well did I exegete this verse right? What does the commentary say? No, actually, when I get into God's Word, I need to see the grace of God because my heart needs it. You're a sheep too. Every time you go to God's Word, every time you're in church and you hear the praises of God's people, every time you pray, you need it just as much as your people. You, you need God's love and you need God's care because how else are you going to survive? How else are we going to play the long game and make it 10 and 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 years? I want you to persevere. I want you to make it to the end. And so the burdens and demands of the pastorate can burn out so many. How many friends have we seen leave the pastorate? Just because they can't keep going. Well, keep your eyes set on heaven. Stay faithful. Keep praying and trust the Lord. So number one, Jesus condescended to us and sympathized with us so we could initiate. 
with others. Number two, our responsibility is to shepherd God's flock. Number three, our goal is to see our members mature in Christ. Number four, our opportunity is to love the foolish and the hurting sheep. Number five, we grow in our skill as shepherds as we listen and we probe hearts. Number six, the bigger picture is not just us bearing the burden, but a culture of discipleship and care. And number seven is perseverance. We are sheep that need a shepherd too, and we only survive by God's strength. Shepherding is is a hard labor, and yet it's a joyous labor. Shepherding is, is a lot of work, and yet it's a joyous work. What a privilege it is, what a privilege to serve the risen King. Yeah, and so, you know, a di- discipleship culture doesn't pop up overnight. So it's not something you can say, we want this, and then next week we have it, or even next year we have it. Uh, when, when we asked a bunch of us who are on staff, asked Mark one day, so when do you think it showed up? Uh, He arrived in 93, and he said it probably showed up at the earliest in the late 90s, if not into the 2000s. You know, it was years of work. You know, a couple of things to think about that. One, you know, as leaders, you need to be doing it. Uh, Members are not going to disciple others unless they see the example. So if you were in our staff offices, what you'd see, because most of our, uh, uh, like 50% of our congregation lives actually in the district. We're, we're, we're literally, when you say a local church, we really are a local church. Uh, and so a key time for us is during the lunch hours to get out and to meet with our members. So our staff offices are empty at the lunch hours because that's a good time to be discipling other members. Uh, so the leadership, the elders actually do this often. And in fact, you can't be an elder in our church if you don't have a fruitful discipling ministry. I don't care how well you pray. I don't care how much how good you teach, if you're not pouring into the lives of others, showing that in the way you live, then actually we're not going to call you to be an elder within our congregation. That would be number one. Uh, Number two, actually we teach it. I mean, what I said earlier, we teach it often. We teach it so often that people can get sick of it. Uh, And so we try and make sure we teach it at every opportunity so that it gets into the bloodstream. Number three, you know, you, you, you structure your services in a way that, that help with a number of things. We structure our services in a way that helps facilitate those kinds of connections, too. You know, one example would be um, our, our, our Sunday evening services is our prayer time. Uh, in traditional Baptist life, Wednesday services were prayer services. We transposed it to our Sunday night because we didn't, you know, most churches on a Sunday night, it's just a miniature version of your Sunday morning. It's kind of the same elements with, a short, with, with the same kind of second sermon, and you have your core crowd, the most loyal folks who show up again on Sunday night. We, we chose to actually do something just very different with our Sunday evening service. So we, we deliberately have something akin to a family time. So it's a prayer meeting. And through the vehicle of sharing prayer requests, you actually come to learn a lot about what's going on in the congregation. Uh, So you'll hear everything from, you know, a former staff member who's visiting from South Africa right now who will be interviewed in the service so we can hear about his pastorate, to we get an update on a missionary and that we pray for that missionary in that service, to the congregation prayed for me last Sunday night as I I got up and shared, and so they so they had a person pray for me as I head out and to New Jersey to teach you all. There's all kinds of things that we share on a Sunday night. Well, Mark will deliberately share a discipling request every Sunday night. And something, it'll go something like this. It'll say, pray that we're a congregation that will learn to ask each other hard questions, that will be intrusive in each other's lives. And, you know, well, you know the, the, the beauty of that is we're not just simply praying, but when the lead guy the main pastor, the teaching pastor, shares that from the pulpit on a Sunday night, it also becomes an expectation for how we live as Christians. It's not just a prayer request anymore. So he circulates through a number of different prayer requests in the services that we pray for often that begins to give some shape and definition to what he even looks like. 
in addition to our teaching. Uh, there's more. That's a couple examples of things that I think shape the culture. And, you know, the great thing is once a number of the congregation members get it, then it takes on a life of its own where members who have been poured into get what discipling looks like and then they're encouraged to do it, so they go out and they do it also. And some members take a little prodding. You know, I've poured into guys and had at times to say, who are you discipling? And they say, not anybody yet. And said, well, go find somebody. <laughs> like, go, go do this. I'm not pouring into you so you can hoard all of this. Take it and give it to somebody else. And then you saw I showed up with handouts. Uh, like, uh, that's a part of our, our church culture. Uh, and and, and, that, and that's because we actually want the disciplers to take everything they're taught and to hand it off and teach the people they're discipling. And an easy way to do that is they've got something in their hand from Sunday morning that they can then go to that midweek lunch meeting, open it up and say, okay, let's talk about that Sunday school class we both sat in. And let's talk over these points and see what you got out of it and what I got out of it. It's a way of taking that and passing it on through the discipling. Uh, you know, it's, it's explicit with our elder board. So the session understands when we call a man that this is a basic requirement of being an elder. It's not written down anywhere. You know, so we don't have, these are the 20 things you must do before you can come on the session. Uh, but there, we've, I mean, we've done this long enough in calling elders that we know the basic requirements that we want, including discipling. Yes. Any books you recommend on gaining listening skills? Um, yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, I mean, obviously, instruments in the Redeemer's hands would be the first thing I'd point to in regards to his section, Love, No, Speak, Do. His sections on No, No Part 1 and No Part 2 are the chapters where he explicitly talks about listening and asking questions. And I, I always hate to talk about my own books, but there's a section on listening in the Pastor and Counseling. Um, so, um, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> well, I mean, and that book doesn't have many footnotes. That book was more generated out of like pastoral ministry. I just sat down and typed it out. <laughs> so other questions? Yes. Yeah, well, so a great question. Tell me your name again. Stephanie. Stephanie. So Stephanie asked about other resources that you can go to to learn about biblical counseling and counseling skills and how to think through it. So um, there's a couple of comments on that. The, 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 uh, the, the, the strength of biblical counseling is biblical understanding, like taking theology and helping us learn how it bears in the difficulties of the Christian life. Uh, taking uh, what we know to be true and helping it into the nitty-gritty details of some of the hardest things in the Christian life and taking the gospel and making it clearly to bear in on these situations. I think the weakness of biblical counseling is skills, the methodology of the do. Like when you get into the room, how do I ask that question? You know, how, how do I then probe into that person's heart? Um, and so, you know, in, in that sense, I think skills is something that the movement is growing in in being able to communicate and convey and try to write more about and, and help others with. With that being said, you know, CCF, obviously, uh, and CCF has done a wonderful job in, uh, in taking what they teach in Glenside and putting it in an online format so that their largest student population is actually not there at Glenside but all over the world now. Uh, they're, they're, they're speaking and engaging with people all over the world. So you don't have to be there to actually engage in those classes and get certificates, which is a huge, huge advantage, I think, for people to step in there. And then the other thing that they have done is between the website, where they have tons of resources, 
the books that they're churning out and a sign of the, the health of the organization is the amount of material has, that's now coming out of CCF. Uh, there's a tons of books that have come out in the last two years, uh, which is a return to the fruitfulness that CCF had in years prior. And then, then also the, the different kinds of booklets that they produce, uh, the resources for changing lives and the other kind of booklets that they have written are all useful. But I, I think the gold mine is the JBC, the Journal of Bill Counseling. I mean, there, there you've got decades of short articles that you can actually link from their website and send to a member. And if you have a catalog and know what's out there, you can actually, I, I give it out like candy. <laughs> I really do. I mean, almost every other situation that walks in the door, I'm po- pointing them to a JBC article that I want them to read. Um, because there you have within six or seven pages a uh, packed theology and practical application to help them through their life. But, you know, in, in the movement now, there's four major, four major counseling conferences uh, in different parts of the year. There is CCF's National Conference, ABC, uh, uh, ABC in Texas, the Association of Biblical Counseling, then ACBC, the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. I don't know why the Biblical Counseling Movement does this, CCF, ABC, ACBC, which sounds more, sounds more like a rock group than it does a counseling organization. <laughs> uh, and, and then Faith Church. All have major conferences. And all are different in the way they handle actually people coming in, how they teach and instruct. So depending on the time of the year and where you're located, you can find a major conference now to get equipped every year. Um, but the last thing is there's a number of websites uh, also, so CCF, ABC, ACBC, and then here's another one, BCC, the Biblical Counseling Coalition, all have tons of content between videos and blog posts and book reviews, just all kinds of things there. So I would start in all those to just begin because it's a, it's a treasure trove right there in actually finding good things. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I'm, I'm not hesitant at all. I mean, uh, I'm, I, I'm Indian, as you can tell, which means every other cousin is a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the best place to have a heart attack is at an Indian family gathering. Because <laughs> I got all the medical help right there I need. <laughs> So I, I, I grew up in a subculture of medicine. Uh, and, you know, if, in my life storyline, I was actually a typical Asian-American geek going to college. I was either going to be an engineer or a doctor. So I went the doctor route, and I actually did half a med school and then left to then go to seminary. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very pro when it comes to medicine, medications, and... and um, very proactive and then encouraging our members. Now, if you haven't read Mike Emlett's Descriptions and Prescriptions, what he did is he hit the exact right balance. And what he does is he calls out those are too hot, are too warm to especially the secular establishment and the way they would look at things. But then also, I think amongst Christians, those are too cold, who don't have a strong doctrine of common grace who aren't willing to make use of the means that God has provided. Uh, and I, so in that sense, I think he's created the exact right balance in helping us understand what it means then to engage doctors. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go for the evangelical Christian psychiatrist who are in our community. That's always going to be my, my first step. Uh, and yet I don't have a reformed evangelical psychiatrist who is a member of our church and committed to nine marks. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a, that's a rare breed. <laughs> so I, I go with other generic evangelical psychiatrists who are helpful. Um, and yet, you know, not everyone can afford to pay out of pocket. So there are, uh, are, are some issues in which, okay, we're going to work with secular psychiatrists because 
the, the help of uh, the crisis of health care now that a lot of people have is that doctors won't do the psychiatric, psychological, the counseling-related work. They'll do the biological chemistry intake, prescribe you something, and leave all the rest to the pastor or counselor. That works to our advantage. <laughs> because I'm not an expert in biology. And so I need to partner with a doctor who is an expert in biology to make sure that we're vetting out any issues that are there. So, you know, I've, and, I, I, and I've got lots of friends in the movement um, uh, in biblical counseling, and so there's disagreements across the board on how to approach different things. But, you know, an example would be on depression, uh, hype, hype, I always mix this up. It's either hyper or hypo, thyroidism. And Cushing syndrome have a strong secondary manifestation of a deep depression. So, you know, I, I had a person years ago who had a thyroid issue. She had a major thyroid issue. I counseled her for months as a, as a Christian pastor dealing with her suffering. It, it was only months into it that I found out when she said she's not taking her thyroid medication anymore that she couldn't afford it, and that she had stopped. Well, I got her to a doctor really fast. We used our benevolence money to pay for those thyroid medications, and bam, the depression was gone. Now, none of that was wasted time. But we're holistic human beings. We're embodied spirits. And so I, I think some of the fault has been friends in the movement, over-spiritualizing things which you think, okay, there's biology at play here. This is how God made us. So I want to partner with a doctor. I just, I just want to find partners like that because otherwise I think I'm, I'm undermining the way God has made us. And I think a strong doctrine of creation is going to lead us to this in taking into account that there is a biology, a physiology, and a chemistry that's involved. Uh, and so we, we want to do that. So I'll, I'll partner with a secular doctor, especially when I know that, you know, the only way they're going to see a doctor is if they have health insurance and they use that health insurance. They can't pay out of pocket. Uh, and, you know, our, our church will help, but we can't pay your doctor's bills for the next 10 years. It's just unrealistic for our church budget to be able to do that, too. So you're, you're going to always strike this balance of wisdom of, of how, how to handle that. Um, so you can follow with me at lunch. I'm happy to talk further about that. But it's just a strong endorsement to just be sure to partner with doctors in the community and just use wisdom. And I, just one last word. Like, I don't know that every Christian doctor has been helpful to us. I, just, I don't want to presume just because he's a Christian that it's actually always going to work out. Um, you know, in one case, we were partnering with a doctor, a Christian doctor in our community, um, and... Um, he had some very different views on marriage and how to handle marriage compared to our elder board, our session. And so we came into conflict a number of times with the member who went to see him and talk through their marital issues and how our elders would handle it. So I, I just don't want to presume. There, there can be great agreement on the gospel but differences and then how we think through the implications of that theology for the Christian life.